Welcome to this Day One Conversation. I'm Peter Wallace, and with us today is Mike Morell. Mike is a journalist and publishing consultant who focuses on strategic foresight. He works with the David Group International, a peace and reconciliation nonprofit organization, and the Wild Goose Festival, what is hoped to be an annual North American justice, arts, music, and spirituality festival. Mike, thanks for talking with us. Thank, thank you for having me here today, Peter. The inaugural Wild Goose Festival is scheduled for June 23rd to 26th at a campground in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Describe what is going to happen there. Yeah, you know, the Wild Goose Festival is a dream that's been in the works for about 10 years now. And there are a lot of legitimate ways to describe how it came to be. The way I like to talk about it is that we've experienced this sort of fourfold alienation. These days, people feel alienated from God. We feel alienated from each other. We feel alienated from our environment, and we even feel alienated from our own bodies. And so one way that we're talking about the Wild Goose Festival is it's a reconciliation festival. It's a place where people who don't ordinarily talk to each other can come together and have a good time, four days of camping, music, workshops, and fun. And hopefully we'll get, we'll get in touch with ourselves, we'll get in touch with nature, and maybe we'll even discover God in the process. Mm. Who are some of the folks that will be featured there? Oh, uh, we have a lot of really wonderful people. We have uh, Jim Wallace, Brian McLaren, Shane Claiborne, Eliasine, uh, Rosario Cruz, Julie Clausen. We just have a number of really talented and gifted men and women who are doing amazing things uh, all over North America. A lot of great musicians as well. Oh. Yes, absolutely. We have uh, Derek Webb. We have the Salters, Michelle Schacht, uh, the Lee Boys, just a lot of uh, really interesting musicians. Now, why is it called the Wild Goose Festival? The Wild Goose is a uh, metaphor for the Holy Spirit that the Celtic Church uses. And so uh, one of our inspirations, the Iona community, um, has revived the Wild Goose in, in contemporary times as an idiom for just sort of the untamable nature of God. You never know where the goose is going to go. <laughs> and sometimes you can end up on a wild goose chase. But, uh, you know, hopefully we'll find ourselves making migration to um, a meaningful place. And you're the chief honker? <laughs> chief honker, uh, you know, stor storyteller in chief, uh, basically communications mm -hmm. uh, coordinator for the festival. Now, the director of Wild Goose, Gareth Higgins, has a background in festivals like this in the United Kingdom. How did he come to be involved in this? Mm, What's his background? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Gareth um, is a veteran of peace and reconciliation work in Northern Ireland. Um, as, as many of your viewers would know, they were, they were plagued by, for many years by what they called the Troubles, which was mm -hmm. this sort of religious and political violence between uh, Catholics and Protestants, where they were, you know, literally at each other's throats, literally threatening each other, killing each other. Gareth's own family had, um, you know, some death threats made against them. He just lived daily in this um, tension of what happens when the discourse turns from civil to sour. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he began working on a nonprofit initiative in Northern Ireland called 028. And in their own small but significant way, they helped bring an end to the state of being there. They brought um, men and women, mostly men, across the table who literally were trying to kill each other and to say, hey, you know, what is it that we really want? None of us actually want to be harming each other. What is it that we can do moving forward, especially since, you know, we all claim to be Christians mm -hmm. here? And I think that that's what motivates um, Gareth in, in a large part. Uh, he was a part of the Greenbelt Festival in England, which in many ways is what we take our inspiration from. Greenbelt's been going on for nearly 40 years now in England, and it's you know very similar to what we're aiming for. It's a justice, arts, and spirituality festival, several days of camping and music. And it's really helped um, define and change the tenor of kind of post-Christendom uh, Christianity and spirituality in Europe. Say a little bit more about how that festival, which has grown from a few hundred back in 1971 to 20,000 these days, how is it affecting the culture of Europe? Mm -hmm. Well, I got to attend uh, Greenbelt back in 2003. I was doing a little bit of a tour uh, throughout Europe, and it was a very, very challenging and encouraging time for me. I was just sort of shocked that a majority of Christians um, that I encountered at this festival seemed to be genuinely engaged in issues like trade justice. Mm. Uh, and they were, they were just really, and it seemed to have complete congruence with their faith. And, and coming from the Bible Belt here in the South where I grew up, I was just, you know, I, I was shocked. I was like, wow, these people are really engaging in issues that matter today. 
the, the, they had a, um, a mass Eucharist on the final day with like, you know, 10, 15,000 people out in bleachers and, um, a, a guy named Johnny Baker, who has pioneered the alt worship movement in uh, in England, mm-hmm. sort of curated that. And I forget exactly the phrasing, but they just beautifully wove their public outcries and concerns for justice in with their devotional and liturgical uh, act of worship. And not every Christian I've encountered in England has been Im- influenced by that vibe, but enough of mm-hmm. them have mm-hmm. that I can really see where Greenbelt has been a uh, trendsetter for that you know, throughout Europe. Let's talk a little bit about your background, um, mm-hmm. the religious and political divide that the United States and North America is experiencing now, you fear may be reaching, reaching a tipping point. And you're all about reconciliation, which is what Christians should be doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. S- talk about that. Yeah. How, how do Christians get involved in acts of reconciliation? That's a wonderful question. You know, I'm... Um, a futurist in training right now, um, working on a degree in strategic foresight. And what I see when I look at the uh, the present day religious landscape in North America, as well as its you know near term future, 15, 20 years, I see that there are you know two roads we can go down. One is you know sitting across from each other and actually listening to each other, and not buying into the sound biting that maybe um, some mainstream media does, but really digging into the underlying theology of why it is that we believe that we do, whether we're conservative or progressive, mm-hmm. Republican mm-hmm. or Democrat or unaffiliated. And what what seems to be happening is uh, there's, there's a great landmark study called uh, American Grace that just uh, was released recently that summarized probably the largest collection of uh, religious sociological data that's, that's yet been compiled in America. And what it showed was that increasing amounts of people are leaving church and organized religion in droves, Mm -hmm. and that one of the biggest indicators for why they're doing that is an increasing politicization of the pulpit and just a feeling that the faith that's being proclaimed is unhealthy. It's Mm -hmm. just like psychologically unhealthy. And so we see a rise of what is known as the spiritual but not religious movement, which I would more precisely define as they're being differently religious. Mm -hmm. They're, They're creating a new form of religion and I think that rather than to be afraid of that, we should embrace that. And the Wild Goose Festival is embracing that as a, as a forward-looking trend, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, not to say that the treasures of, of Christianity um, just need to be done away with, but to, to compost them. You know, we, we see these institutions that are in decay right now. And even within the decay and then within the rot of some of it, this beautiful new life is springing forth. It's, it's sprouting up in kind of an organic expression mm-hmm. of something new. One of the problems that I've seen in the spiritual but not religious uh, phenomenon is the fact that many of those folks are not involved in a community. They are mm-hmm. self-spiritual. Mm-hmm. Um, are there ways that you see that communities can be built around the spiritual but not religious, even like the Wild Goose Festival, but ongoing. Yeah, I I think so. I think so. You know, I think that one way in which spiritual but not religious people are especially vulnerable, and they don't even realize it, is they're very vulnerable to commercialization. They're very vulnerable to to marketers Mm -hmm. and uh, who want to sort of sell them this custom package to where they have to end up paying to play, you know, for their own spirituality that they, they purchase one installment at a time. And I think that the church, at her best, is a place that that transcends commercial interests mm-hmm. and can and can really be a place to nurture spiritual growth when when we're being healthy. And so, one thing I do see is is a definitely a proliferation of what I would call church for amateurs. Mm. You know, the etymology of amateur is a lover, mm-hmm. you know, versus a professional who is someone that maybe gets paid for something. I'm a part of a, um, a small a church birthing in Raleigh called Trinity's Place, and we're loosely affiliated with the Alliance of Baptists. Mm-hmm. Our co-founders are both you know, seminary educated, but neither of them are taking a paycheck for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They both have day jobs that they're happy with, but they're doing this because they love it. And as a result, it's bringing other people who love church, who love expressions of spirituality, and we're all bringing our gifts to the table, kind of that Protestant idea of the priesthood of all believers Mm -hmm. taken to a very practical conclusion. 
And, and I think that I see that springing up all over the place. Uh, to give you a local example here in the metro Atlanta area, there's a community called Neighbors Abbey uh, that meets in the uh, Capitol View mm-hmm. neighborhood, which is one of the roughest neighborhoods mm-hmm. in the area. And I believe that they are uh, an initiative of the PCUSA denomination. And uh, it's about half people who live within this neighborhood, and the other half is interested parties. And when I've uh, spent some time with them, I see the same thing happening. Everyone brings their gifts and talents. They do have you know, leadership. They do have people who uh, spearhead it, like my friend Troy Bronsing. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's just a lot of, uh, of activity going on around there. Or even more recently still, you know, last night I spent some time at uh, Sister Louisa's Church of the Living Room and Ping Pong Emporium, <laughs> which is a new bar off of Edgewood Avenue. And my understanding is it's formed by a uh, Princeton seminary dropout who cares passionately about God and spirituality, but never fit into a conventional Christian box. And he wanted to create a um, sort of kitschy place bordering on blasphemous, but all Mm -hmm. to show the abundant love of God. That like, if if even this can't separate us from the love of God, then this is a wonderful message to proclaim. And I have, you know, friends in the Atlanta area who are either Christian or not, but they spend some time in this place that's just nicknamed church. And they have um, they have sing-alongs with the organ. They have preach-offs. They listen to messages, and they have arguments and discussions. And so I think that you know America, as has been observed from De Tocqueville on forward, is a deeply religious place. And I don't think that that's changing. But I do think what's changing is the amount of faith we're putting in to professionals to manage our religion for mm-hmm. us. And so, you know, I'm hoping that Wild Goose can actually be a neutral zone to reconcile the spiritual but not religious with those who acknowledge that they are religious but want to be religious in a way that is responsive to and adaptive to contemporary needs. You're a graduate of Berry College, and you're now a graduate fellow in strategic foresight at Regent University in Virginia. Mm -hmm. As you've said, you are a religious futurist. What does that mean? What what do you aim to do? Well, yes, as, as a as a religious futurist, basically what I hope to do, and I'm and I'm still in the process in the program. I'm, I'm going through it slowly but uh, surely. But what I'm learning is just how to work with interested parties, be they denominations or congregations or publishing houses or even just small groups of people who who care about the future of of their faith and in, in my case, Christian faith and who want it to be resilient and adaptive, but not only sort of reacting to trends, but actually proactively creating the future that we want to see. So I'm developing a toolkit using some quantitative tools, some qualitative imaginative tools to help people to look at the range of possible future scenarios for where the church is heading, where where faith is heading, and uh, just give us a handle so that we move out of the, sort of the reactive anxiety mode and move into a more uh, proactive space. Mm. So who should consider going to the Wild Goose Festival? You know, it's way more of a psychographic than a demographic. You, some people might mistakenly think, oh, it's a festival for music and activism. Youth and young adults should go. And it's absolutely true. Youth and young adults should go. <laughs> and and we do have, you know, a lot of churches who are bringing buses of people coming. In fact, we recently um, offered a reduced student rate that's good, I believe, for the next month. And it's a $99 um, rate for students, which is a huge savings off of our 159 at the door. But we have equal numbers of people who might be considered senior citizens who are writing us and saying, you know, we love Richard Rohr mm-hmm. or, um, you know, we want to hear Phyllis Tickle. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not just having sort of these uh, these young darlings of uh, <laughs> contemporary media show up. We, we're honoring our, our elders. We have uh, some civil rights veterans who are, who are coming and speaking. And so we have people across the age spectrum who are coming. Some, some of the older folks uh, don't necessarily want to camp in a North Carolina in July, which I totally <laughs> respect. Uh, There are hotels within about a 20 to 30 minute drive of the festival. So I would say who should come? Anyone who's concerned about the future of faith in North America and doesn't just want to be sitting on the sidelines, but wants to be present at something that will be creating something new from uh, from the ground up. And we're featuring resources from Wild Goose on dayone.org. Or for more information about the festival, people can visit the website. Mm -hmm. They can go to wildgoosefestival.org. And from there, you'll also see um, a link to our Pathios co-sponsored blog. Mike, any final thoughts? Um, no, just we really appreciate uh, what you're doing with, with Day One, bringing a voice to a lot of new things that are happening across the spiritual landscape. And uh, we hope that your uh, viewers will like to come out to the goose. Great, great. Mike Morell, thanks for talking with us. Thank you.